Welcome to the ball flight activity. Eight competitors will get the six throws here. Here's Mitchell. What a year she's had. Two huge Australian records. Seventh best of all time now. Huge throw for Mitchell. Massive throw. It was so big that the cameraman didn't know where to look. And that is over the game's record. That is the way you open the final. Outstanding start there for Catherine. An unbelievable start. A picture of relaxation on the runway, and then she just absolutely hammers it out of the hand and well beyond the game's record. What a start. So we wait for the distance. 68-92. 68-92 is an Australian record. So in the video that you just watched, you saw Catherine Mitchell, who's an Australian athlete, set a new Commonwealth Games record with a throw that was almost 70 metres long. So what we could see from that is the way that that javelin actually flew through the air is essentially a parabolic shape. So Catherine was standing somewhere here, or she ran up to some point, and this is Catherine who's about to throw her javelin. And what she threw is a shot that does something like this. So the javelin went up in the air, it reached a maximum turning point here before landing on the ground some distance away from her. So what we can note about this is that the flight path was essentially parabolic. And we can also notice that the flight path of indeed any object, because it must go up and then gravity will bring it down, it will have a maximum turning point somewhere. And we could also note that the object would fly until it hits something like ground level or another object. So we could note down here that there's generally going to be an x-intercept. There's also the point at which the ball or the javelin or something like that is thrown or hit from. And that's usually, not always, but usually what we'd consider the y-intercept of the graph. And now before we move on from this example, I'd just like to talk about what we might call these axes or how we might label them. So what we're measuring here is essentially the height of the object. So we might use H here as being the height, perhaps in metres, of the ball or of the javelin. And the length this way we might call the distance or the horizontal distance to be accurate. So we might have H and D instead of X and Y in which case this would more technically be called the H-intercept, and this would be the D-intercept. But that's a general overview of a flight path of an object, and now what I'd really like to get you guys to do is go out and get your own film of you throwing or hitting a ball through the air. So here's an example of one that I took just so that you have an example of what you might be trying to film. Right. Oh, oh. So before you go out and get your own footage of a ball or object that you've thrown or kicked, there's just a few things that I'd like to point out. So you might find it useful to get a family member or a friend to help with the filming of it. You should make sure that the video that you capture, you can see the entire flight path, so nothing's cut off from it. And you should try and have some sort of scale or something that you can work with in the photo or the film to get an idea of how far the ball's gone and how high it's gone. So in the one that I did, I knew the length of the court and I could also approximate the height based on perhaps how big I was in the photo compared to where the shuttle reached when I hit it. Finally, you may find it useful rather than taking a film or a video, you might prefer to take a burst on your phone or even take a slow motion film so that you can really slow down where that object is throughout its flight path. So when you get a chance, head off and make sure you capture your own footage of the flight path of an object. So now just to give you an example, I'm going to use the footage of that video that I showed before of a flight path of a shuttle, just to show you how you might progress with this activity. So a little bit like the javelin 
throw that we saw at the start of the video, hitting the shuttle also resulted in the shuttle going up, turning, and then coming down. And now using my knowledge of the length of the court and also thinking about how high off the ground I was when I hit it, I could start to find a few points that I think that are on this flight path. So I'm going to say for this question that I hit the ball from D is zero, so zero distance from me, and a height of one meter. And I'm picking fairly convenient coordinates here so that we get a relatively nice equation that I can show you in this video, but yours might not be quite as contrived or quite as constructed as this example is. And then for argument's sake, I'm going to say that that shuttle landed at a distance of 10 meters from where I hit it. So that point would be 10 comma zero. And then based on how high I am or how tall I am in the shot compared to where the shuttle reached, I'm going to approximate that this maximum is close to, and based on the equation I get out later, you'll see that it's not quite at this coordinate, but I'm going to say that it occurred about five meters horizontally from me and at a height of about nine meters. So that means that this, just to put a scale on, would be five, and this could be nine just here. So that's an example of a graph of a flight path. And now that you've got your footage, hopefully you can move on to producing a similar graph and you can approximate three coordinates where the ball or object that you threw or kicked passes through. It's really important here to note that when you're trying to find the equation of a parabola or a quadratic, which is what we're about to do, you need three points to do that. So make sure you've approximated three points that you think are on that flight path for the next part of the activity. So next up, you'll need to grab out a CAS calculator of some description. And for this particular model, I'm going to need to go into the statistics menu. And you can see what I'm doing just over here. So in list one, I'm going to put the X values of these coordinates. So I'm going to have zero, as my first one, and then going down list one, the next number I'll put in is five, and then going down again, I'll put in 10. And now moving to list two, I'm going to put the Y values of each of those coordinates. So zero was paired up with a Y value of one, so I'll put one in that position. Five was with nine, so I'll put a nine there, and then 10 was with zero, so I'll put a zero here. And next we're going to go calc, regression, and we're going to click on quadratic regression, which is just in blue on your screen at the moment. And it can see that the X list, or the X values are in list one, the Y values are in list two, so that's good. And all we need to do now is hit OK, and it gives us the quadratic regression, or it goes through and finds the equation of the quadratic. And you can see that it's found it in the form AX squared plus BX plus C where A from our calculator is negative 0.34, B is 3.3, and C is one. So we can go ahead and we can now write an equation with that information. So based on what the calculator gave us, we can now write out the general form of this equation. And we're going to use H here because they're the variables we discussed might be more appropriate for a ball flight um, situation. So H is going to equal negative 0.34, and that was the coefficient of x squared, so that's now going to be d squared. And then we had plus 3.3 as the b value, which is the coefficient of just x, or in this case d. And that constant value was plus 1. So this is the equation that describes the flight path of that shuttle that I hit in that video. When we hit OK on our calculator screen, it actually graphs that parabola. And that's a similar shape to what we've got drawn up here, which is a really, really good thing to note. What I'm going to do though, is I'm now going to go into the main menu and I'm just going to type in that equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and type in negative 0.34 and I'm going to use X and Y um, for this equation or just X at the moment to represent D. So we're going to have negative 0.34 X to the power of two then we're going to have plus 3.3x plus 1. So now we can highlight that and go interactive transformation factor, and we could use factor or R factor to try and factorize this. And now for this particular example, I will admit that I picked these coordinates to be fairly convenient for this so that I knew that it would work. So I can just click factor 
and it will give me the factorized form and that doesn't look too bad. Yours might be a little bit more complicated and that's okay. You might at this point just wanna have some decimal values in there, perhaps to two or three decimal places and that's more than fine. So based from what was on the calculator screen, we now know that the factorized form is h is equal to negative one over 50. And then we had x subtract 10. So we're going to have d subtract 10 in this first set of brackets. And that shouldn't come as a massive surprise because this d subtract 10 is related to the d intercept that was at positive 10. And then in the second set of brackets, we have 17 d plus five. So that is the factorized form for this quadratic. The last thing that you might consider doing with the calculator is finding the turning point form. So we can do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy out the expanded or general form. And I'm just going to go edit copy so that we have that stored in the calculator's memory. And then going to the menu, we can find the conics menu. And in here, we can now go and paste in after we type in y equals, we can go edit, paste, and that will have the expanded form in. And then we can go fit into conics form. And the third one down you can see is that turning point form. And clicking on there and then OK converts this into turning point form. And you can see this calculator has given us the exact values for A, H and K. But for this video I think decimals would be enough. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to copy that and then going to the main menu, I'm just going to paste it in here. So edit, paste, and then hitting execute, I can tap on that and turn it to a decimal. So we get y equals negative 0.34 times x take, say 4.85 all squared, plus 9.01 if we did this to two decimal places, which is a suitable way to do it. So finally, our turning point form, which is h is equal to, and it's going to be negative 0.34 times d subtract 4.85. And we're just doing two decimal places here, squared. And then we had plus 9.01. And that's going to be that turning point form of this particular situation or parabola. So that's how we can use our calculator to perform a quadratic regression, which finds the equation of that parabola for us. And we've now got it in all three forms. We've got it in general form, we have it in factorized form, and we also found it in turning point form. So the next thing you might wanna do with the calculator is actually sketch the equation that it gave you. Because it's obviously going to go through these three points, that's the way the rule was constructed. But we don't necessarily know that five nine is the turning point. In fact, from turning point form, we know the turning point is close to 4.85, and 9.01. So what we're going to do is we're gonna click the graph icon, and then what we're going to do is we're going to simply drag down one of these rules. So I'm just going to drag down the general rule into that space, and it's going to graph that parabola for me. And we can zoom in and out and move it along a little bit, but one of the great things we can do with the calculator is use the four arrows up the top of the screen to set our own view window. So based on what we have here, I'm going to go from x is negative one to x is 11. So we're just going to put that in. And then the y minimum, I'm also going to go perhaps from minus two this time, up as high as 12, just to give us a little bit of wiggle room so we can see all of the graph. And hitting okay gives us a nice view of that graph. And then we can do things like analysis g-solve, and we can use root to find the x-intercepts. And now one of them's at a negative value, which we won't need to include, because that would have been on the other side where the shuttle didn't fly through. So the shuttle started here and stopped there. So we don't have to worry about the x-intercept on that side, which is around negative 0.3. But the one across on the other side, and we can just hit the arrow button to get there, that's going to be at 10, 0, which is exactly where it was. The other thing you might want to find is to go analysis g-solve y-intercept and the y-intercept the way that we created this is going to be at one so this point is still exactly in the rule that the calculator gave us so there hasn't been any major changes yet but what we do find has changed slightly is analysis g-solve max will find that maximum turning point 
and you can see from the calculator that it's at 4.85, 9.01, which we discussed before from our turning point form. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change that turning point to match what the equation is and what it's given us. So this coordinate I'm just going to change to be 4.85, correct to two decimal places, comma 9.01. So even though we use the coordinate 5 comma 9, and that of course would still be on the graph, just a little bit over here, we're going to put that as the turning point on our final graph for this activity. So the last thing that I'm going to encourage you to do is come up with a minimum of five questions about this ball flight, or in this case, the flight of the shuttlecock. So what we're going to do is we're just going to come up with questions that relate to this graph. So for example, our first question could be, at what height is the shuttle hit? So we could do that for part A. And now I'm not going to answer these questions straight away. I'll just leave a gap and fill in the answers at the end. You might wanna have a go at using this graph and this rule to answer the questions that I'm posing. Another question that we might ask is, what is the height of the shuttle when it's at a horizontal distance of three meters? And again, I won't answer this right now, but I'll put the answer up in a moment for you. Another question could be, what is the maximum height of the shuttle? And now for the fourth part of these set of questions, we could ask, Another thing relating to the maximum height, and that is how far horizontally was the shuttle when it reached its maximum height? And finally, we could pose a question that is our fifth part. It's going to be at what horizontal distances is the shuttle when it's at a height of six meters? So they are just five questions we could have asked about this. There's many other questions that could be asked. And your job now might be to come up with some different questions that relate to your particular situation. And just a reminder that it is a really good idea after you've asked the question to see if you can go and work out what the answer is. So I'll put the answers up here so that you can check how you went at answering these questions for this particular situation. So good luck completing this task and make sure that you get through getting a film of throwing or hitting an object through the air. Make sure you can find an equation using the CAS calculator. Make sure you can sketch a graph and then improve it using the calculator. And then make sure that last step, you go and create some questions about it and actually give the answers to those as well. So good luck and have fun.